scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now John's disciples and Pharisees were fasting. And people came and said to me, Why did John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees? I said Mark chapter 1. Yeah. Is that what you're reading? Mark chapter 1. 16 to 20. And passing along the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little further. No one is ready. This is another person here, Matthew 28, 19 to 20. John chapter 1, verse 33 to 49. He said, I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me. The man on whom you see the spirit, the spirit come down and remain in is he who will, who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I, and I testify that this is the Son of God. The next day, John went, was there again with two of his disciples. Then he saw Jesus passing by. He said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you today? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simeon, Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simeon and tell him, We have found the Messiah. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simeon, son of John. You will be called Sephas which is translated to Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathaniel and told him, we have found the one who is wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good, anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here is a true Israelite, in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Praise the Lord. Did anybody get Matthew 28? 28. 19 to 20. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Go then to all people everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you always to the end of age. Praise the Lord. Our key scripture here is Mark chapter 1, 16 to 17. That's our key verse. Who is the disciple? The disciple is one chosen and trained by a master to follow in his ways. A disciple is one chosen and trained by a master to follow in his ways. So from the scriptures we read, there are people Jesus called directly, and there are those he called to others. So in whichever way, 
a disciple needs to be trained. Jesus wants us, he wants us to go and draw people you know, to him. He wants us to bring people to him. So our response should be immediate obedience, just as we just saw in the scriptures we read, how the disciples obeyed immediately. When Jesus said, follow me, all of them just, the people he called just followed him. There was no excuse. The one of us said in the book of nice, uh, uh, Luke 9, Luke 9, says, anyone who places his hand on the plow and looks back, is not fit for the kingdom. So, if God has called you, if you have that calling in your life, you don't need to give excuses. You don't need to look back. Just go ahead and do that that God wants you to do. Just find out what He wants you to do and do it. Praise the Lord. Now, if I have to disciple someone, if I have to disciple someone, that means I need to be disciple myself. Is it not true? If you have to disciple someone, you need to be disciple yourself. That is why you are sitting down here listening to this uh, topic. So first of all, discipleship starts with me. Discipleship starts with me. It starts with you. I can't be a disciple without being trained. I can't be a disciple, you know, without being trained. I can't be a disciple without dealing with my character. I can't be a disciple without living an exemplary life, the life that can affect others. There is something I noticed in that uh, uh, reading, in John chapter 1, uh, verse 41. Andrew, Andrew called, first of all, called his own brother. That is what the one of us he said. Andrew, first of all, called his own brother. What is that telling us? That tells us that, you know, when we are disciples, we should not forget our family members. We shouldn't forget our family members. So, if there is no point for you to be a born again, you know, you are a disciple of Christ and your family is born. So, don't forget your family members. Go home and start discipling your family. Let us look at the reason of being a disciple. The reason of being a disciple. Mark, let's see Mark chapter 3, verse 13 to 15. Mark chapter 3, verse 13 to 15. Please, if you are there, I read. I don't have all the time. Mark chapter 3, verse 13 to 15. Mark chapter 3, verse 13 to yeah. Nobody has got the scripture. Then Jesus went up with you. And God himself come to himself the man he wanted. They came to him and he closed and he chose the twelve. He chose the twelve when he named the apostles. I have chosen you to be with me and to do them. I want I will also send you out to preach, and you will have authority to drive out him on. Praise the Lord. So one of the reasons of being a disciple is to be with the master. One of the reasons of becoming a disciple is to be with the master. The first calling of the disciple is to know him personally, learning all there is to learn and drawing strength from him. When you do this, you are establishing a relationship. As a result of this relationship, you will be able to lead others to the saving knowledge of Christ. You can't testify about him if you do not know him. There is no way you can testify about him if you do not know him. So you have to sit with him, you have to know him, you have to read the word of God, you have to allow him to speak to you. 
or else what are you going to testify about? What are you going to tell other people? And this calls for a holy living. This kind of relationship calls for a holy living because light and darkness cannot go together. Praise the Lord. Another reason of becoming a disciple from what we read from the scripture is to preach and to make disciples of people. Jesus wants us to make disciples of people. He wants us to go out there to bring people to the kingdom. So it is not the law to get people converted. We should follow up in discipleship. Follow up in discipling them so that they will be grounded in the world. They will be grounded in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ so that they can go out there and talk to another person about Christ. Praise the Lord. Another reason of being a disciple is to have power to heal the sick and cast out demons. To have power to heal the sick and cast out demons. And this is backed up by Jesus' authority. He sent them out and he did what he said, Go, I empower you to heal the sick and cast out demons. So these are some of the reasons you know, of becoming a disciple. Another part is to baptize those who believe, who believe, baptize them with water so that they will be able to renounce it and commit themselves to Christ. Let us look at the qualities of a disciple. Qualities of a disciple. One of them is obedience. Obedience. As you hear God's voice, you need to act immediately. As you hear His voice, you need to act immediately. Do not delay. Because delay will be dangerous. At the point God is speaking to you, there must be a reason you know, for you to do that which He's talking to you about immediately. Do not Day. I will share briefly what happened uh, one day when we were in the mission field at the beginning. We divided ourselves into two. A group went to Cameroon and one group went to the degree. I was among the group that went to the degree. So one day, I was led to fast. So uh, after two days of fasting, I just, you know, said, I don't even know why I'm fasting. I said, the Lord, you just told me to fast, but I don't even know why I'm fasting. Immediately I said that, I fell into a trance. And the Lord took me to a wide road. Then I saw our, one of our people that went to the Road. I saw him standing on the road. So I stopped. I was driving a little car in that trance. I said, what are you doing all alone in this wide road? And, and she said, ah, that she's stranded alone. I said, how can you be stranded, you know, when I have a car? I said, enter inside. She said, okay, in that case, let me go and call others. And I shook off, you know, out of that class. I said, ah, what kind of uh, revelation is this? I said, ah, is that what you said I too fast? So I called my school here. I said, ah, I just got a revelation now. It's like these people are stranded. Let us call them and find out, you know, what is happening. And he said, ah, they are supposed to you know, come back this week. Okay, let's call. And we called. We called and called and called. You know, there was no response. So, because we were going out, you know, for something somewhere, we went and came back again and called. And we got them. And they said they've been in Calabar Port, you know, for a day now. We don't say, ah, what happened? They said they don't even have five naira to buy beer water. Not to come, come uh, talk of transporting them, them, uh, themselves to Potaco. So, we started praying. Come and see prayer. We prayed all manner of prayers, asking God to intervene. After about, about two hours, we called back again, and they said, good news. That guess what? We saw what happened. They said, one man just, you know, walked up to them and said, introduced himself, and said, he is a pastor, and that the Lord told him to give them this money. And they calculated the money, and that's the exact amount they needed to transport and send to the So who said God does not answer prayer? So if I had delayed, what would have happened? God 
God gave that revelation, and I acted immediately. Praise the Lord. So when God gives you a revelation, do not delay. Do not delay. Just act immediately. Another quality of the good disciple is humility. Humility. Humility will go a long way to, you know, take a disciple to his place of calling. If you remove pride, if you remove pride, you will be able to bring you because pride will always bring you down. Submit yourself to existing authority. As a disciple, just remove pride and be humble. Always look up to God and God will help you. Another quality is to be quick to repent when you, when you commit sin. Be quick to repent when sin is committed. Be quick to repent when sin is committed. There are some people when they do something, you know, they are ashamed you know, to talk about it. But there are some people, you know, they just go straight to God and confess their sin, and God will restore them back. I, don't, I want to share another testimony, testimony about one of us too. in the mission field. We went out and we were instructed not to swim. We were instructed not to swim. So, because there was no water where we went to, we always go in the trek a lot distance in fed water. So, that when I decided to go to the swim to wash, wash our clothes, one of us now sticks out and we went to one corner and swam. As we came back, we fell sick. This guy fell sick, we prayed, took him to the hospital, he didn't recover. We prayed, he didn't recover. So we have to call this ah, come and see what is happening because it is getting out of hand. So the boy now walked up to us and said, You want to learn the confession? And I said, What is it? So he told us, Do you know that after that confession, the boy got home? We didn't pray for him. Just, just the confession. We just got well. We didn't pray for him. We didn't dare. But we have been praying all this while for him. We are taking to taking him to hospital. We have spent money buying drugs. He didn't get well. Just because he broke the rules. Just because he broke the rules. And he has. After the confession, he got well. Nobody prayed for him. Praise the Lord. So always remember, you know, to adhere to instructions. Always remember to adhere to instructions so that you do not uh, get yourself into trouble. As a good disciple, you have to make yourself available. Be ready to go at all times. Be ready to go at all times. I'll talk about uh, look like you know, when, uh, uh, when somebody places his arm on a bar and goes back, the one of us says it's not fit for the kingdom. So just don't give excuses. Don't give excuses. Just go and do that with God tells you to do. Perseverance. Perseverance. If the calling is there, you have the grace to endure hardship. If God has called you, no matter the kind of persecution you go through, you have the grace to endure. Because God will back you up. He is the one that has called you. The work is not about your own. It's not about you. It's about you. So you always want to do for you. Praise the Lord. Another quality is commitment. You have to be committed to the cause. Looking unto Jesus as your example. Bear fruit. Bear fruit. Jesus said in his word that he has anointed us to bear fruit and that the fruit will remain. So we souls for Christ and also follow it up to make sure that that soul will work for me to not dwell. Praise the Lord. Another quality of the good disciple is that this disciple has to be self-controlled. You have to control yourself. And the disciple is not supposed to be easily given to anger. You are not supposed to be easily given to anger. The one of us said that uh, man's anger does not fulfill God's righteousness. So just be careful because provocations will come here and here. It will come here and then the way you handle it, it 
depends on you. Praise the Lord. Accountability. You have to be careful in little things entrusted to you so that God can give you more. Be careful in little things entrusted to you so that God can give you more. Another quality is to show love. Show love and be passionate about the work. Jesus says, love one another, and that is how the world will know that you are my disciples. Love one another. That is how the world will know that you are my disciples. Above all, a disciple should be there, live an exemplary life. A life that will inspire people. You will not be preaching one thing and doing another thing. Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light shine before men so that they will see it and glorify God. Let your light shine before men so that they will see it and glorify God. So, don't be preaching one thing and you'll be doing that another. They are by living a hypocritical life. Praise the living God. Let us look at some obstacles. Some obstacles. Something that can hinder us from reaching out, from becoming a disciple. That most of the time, how to start, how to start to preach you know, is a problem. I remember those days when we were starting the new, when we go out to preach the word. It's like, who is going to start first? If one person says, go in prayer, then the mantle will fall on the other person to start preaching. So, when we go out there, we find that somebody first of all, you know, rush and start the open prayer so that the other person will start you know, to preach. So, you don't have to, <laughs> you don't have to do that. Jesus said, don't even worry about what to preach. At the right time, he will do what? He will provide what to preach. So, don't worry about what to preach. That thing troubled me, you know, during my own time when I started the, when I started the, when I was in the mission school. I, I continue to dodge prayer. I continue to dodge, even to go out, when we go out to preach, I continue to, you know, uh, lag behind so that maybe my own will be just to sing praises or do one or two things. To preach, I always dodge it because of how to start. So one day, something happened. Something happened that changed my whole life. There was a prophecy concerning me. As, a, as that person was giving that prophecy, I was writing it down, another person was recording it. In fact, the person bought it, you know, correctly as the Lord said it, because he, he mentioned my name. So I want to read it because sometimes, most of us, uh, they go to he said, Junior, yeah, you will not be able to hear from me or speak for me if you are looking at yourself. You will always be inadequate. You will always be unworthy for what I call you to do. But it will never be your adequacy or worthiness that causes me to use you. You must not look at your inadequacy, but look to my adequacy. You must stop looking at your own unworthiness and look to my righteousness. When you are used, it is because of who I am, not who you are. That's what the Lord told me. I said, my God. So this kind of thing, I'm not, I, I'm not going to escape it. I, I'm not going to escape it. Look at the kind of prophecy that came. My name was mentioned, not as if, you know, it was just a very prophecy like that. My name was mentioned. I shouldn't look at my inadequacy. So I've been limiting myself. So ask yourself, question, have you been limiting yourself? Has God called you to do one thing or the other for him? How have you taken it? Have you been limiting yourself? Stop limiting yourself. Stop looking at yourself. Maybe you cannot speak very well. Maybe because of crowd. Ah, you are crowd worried. Uh, what would they say about me if I make a mistake? Maybe if I blow one grammar that is wrong, how would they take it? 
God said, stop looking at your own unworthiness. Look at his own worthiness. Because when he uses you, it is not because of who you are. It is because of who he is. So stop limiting yourself. After that day, I stopped limiting myself. Two weeks ago, somebody called me to come and minister somewhere. I, I was like, and the whole thing is that I wanted my own topic. They, said, they chose a topic for me. A topic for me. I said, Father, how am I going to do this? But the Lord encouraged me. I want. So stop limiting yourself. So looking at yourself. So looking at your worthiness. You know, looking at people. What will people say about you? What will they think about you? Stop limiting yourself. That is the message God is telling you today. That is what God is telling you today. God is going to use you. You know, just make yourself available. It will use you to the level that you know that is beyond your imagination. Praise the Lord. There are some people, you know, their own uh, limitations or all circles are maybe family ties. But when you want to go out to reach out to someone, that is when uh, your wife will remember that uh, yesterday you didn't give them enough money for food and was provided today. You know, one thing or the other will spring off from the family. Maybe it's a sickness, maybe a distant relative you know, coming for help somewhere. So the one you have is to reach out for us. The, God, uh, the work of God, you use it for your family. You know, most times it is because we don't trust Him enough. When we trust Him, you know, absolutely, God will make provision even for those things. Well, Jesus gave the story of that rich man when He called the man you know, to follow Him sell all his possessions and follow him. The man looked at you know all the words he has and said, how can I leave all these things? I'm sure that's what he will be thinking about. Who will enjoy all this work if I follow him? And he refused. And Jesus said it is it will be difficult for what? A rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Why did he say that? Because of what? Because some people attach so much importance to what they have. They attach so much importance to their possessions. Jesus said, it will be difficult for them to enter the kingdom of heaven. So don't allow their riches so their wealth or whatever it is, your possessions so to hinder you, you know, from becoming a disciple. Don't allow it. You can use your wealth to work for God. You can use your money to work for God. You can use your possession to work for God. So don't allow anything to hinder you. Praise the Lord. Persecution. Some people have dropped out because of persecution. Some people have dropped out because of persecution. But persecution will always be there, whether we like it or not. It will always be there. So when it comes, let us handle it. You know, take it to God because He has called you. Because he has called you, God will always back you up. He will give you the grace to endure that persecution. He will give you the grace to come out of that persecution. Didn't the word of God tell us that the when we are tempted, that God will do what? He will provide a way out. So we we'll look at that way out. We we'll look look at you know look at that way out out of every persecution. Praise the Lord. Let us look at disciple at work. Disciple at work. Can we read Mark chapter 6, 7 to 13? Mark chapter 6, 7 to 13. Mark chapter 6, 7 to 19. Gave them power over unclean spirits, 
and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a scrap money, no creed, no bread, no money in their purse. But he saw the with sandals and not put on two coats. And he said unto them, In what place soever ye enter into an house, there abide ye at the pass from that place. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when you depart then shake off the dust under your feet, for a testimony against them. Very very I say unto you, we shall no more parade for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many demons, and anoint them with well, many that were sick and healed them. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Jesus first of all sent them out two by two. Send them out two by two. You know there are people that go alone for evangelism. There are those that just go on their own to minister to people. They go to disciple people. If you if you did not receive any instruction to go alone, do not go. If you do, if you didn't receive any instruction to go alone. Do not go because it could be dangerous. This was sent them two by two because they needed to support one another. They needed to support one another. If there is anything, you know, any danger, there is somebody, you know, to serve as a witness. One day, in Medjugorje, when we went for outreach, one of the boys that went with us went to minister to one lady, a married lady in her house. In fact, we go to the compound, that compound to fetch water. It's an equa, equa church. We go to that church to fetch water. So after fetching water, the boy would just branch. Drop the bucket and enter the lady's house. She's a married lady. So one day, it's like some people told their husband about what is happening. I don't know what they were thinking. So the husband one day pretended as if he went to work and then uh, hit somewhere. So when they told him that the boy, the, boy, the man now appeared, entered his house and held this one and said that the boy came to rape the wife. In fact, he took God's intervention to save that boy that day. He took God's intervention to save him. So if the Lord did not say we should go alone, don't go alone, always go with someone. Jesus knows why he sent them two by two. It is not him. He didn't make a mistake. Don't go alone. Always go with somebody. He empowered them to cast out demons. He empowered them to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to make disciples you know, of people. Acts 1 8. Can someone read that? Acts 1 8. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 and it says, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria. And on all outer, outermost part of the earth, praise God. There you go. So, you see, Jesus empowered them himself. He said they shouldn't go until the Holy Spirit descends on them. And he knows the reason why he did that. So, before we go to minister, we make sure that we are prepared to go spiritually and physically. Praise the Lord. Another thing. In that scripture, it says they should take staff 
and sandals. Staff and sandals uh, signifies movement. Staff, movement. And staff and sandals, movement, staff to support the movement. And he said, take no bag, take no bread, take no money. See, all those things can serve as obstacles. At that point in time, Jesus knows why he told them to do so. He said, take no bread, no bag, no money. It could serve as an obstacle. It could be a distraction. It could also be not trusting God enough. So our security does not lie in those things. That is what the Lord is telling us. Our security does not lie in those things. The word of God says in the book of Matthew 6, it says, Seek you the kingdom of God and this righteousness and every other thing shall be added unto you. So when we trust God enough, when we trust Him enough, He will provide for us. If we trust Him enough, He will provide for us. All those things He told them not to go with, it could be a distraction. It could be not trusting God enough. It could be obstacles in the the preaching of the word of God. So when God tells us to go, we should obey him and do exactly as he has told us to do. I will share briefly another testimony. This one uh, happened in Plateau State. In fact, first of all, we went to Belo State for mission work. We were to stay in the house of the pastor. It's a white man. So as we got there, just one week into that uh, program, they called us to go to Plateau State. States. And these people that were in their house, they, were, they, they told us that they support us in everything we need. So because they have called us to leave that place, their support didn't come again. So we went ahead. We went ahead to Plateau State. Lantan to be precise. So as we got to Lantan, the place they gave us to stay was just one small mud, one small hut. You know all this uh, hut that they build with mud, all these mud houses. Just one small uh, hut like that. And if you are entering, you just bend down to enter the house. So we just packed our tents, pitch our tents outside because there were a lot of trees there. We pitch our tents outside. One week into the uh, program there, because we went there to disciple Muslim converts. One week into that program, some missionary group just came visiting us. And they said, What are the missionaries here? Do you know what they built? They built two houses. That is the same one that they This one is bigger. Two houses so that the boys can stay you know, separate, the girls can stay separate. They will have the other one. You know, to pack our things. And they now gave us money for our feeding because before then we were just feeding one zero one at times. Zero one zero. Even the, the one zero one, the, the first one is very, very light. You know, it will not carry anybody. It is the last one that is heavy. That first one is very, very light. So when they now came and gave us money, they gave us even class for money to go back whenever we finish our program. So we were enjoying. You know, we enjoyed very, very well. That's, that that which I liked it very, very much because we enjoy we are eating that is three square meal a day. Three square meal a day. Just because we trust them. Though. We trust them. Because some people when we were going, they were like, how are we going to go now? You know, how are we going to go? They said, let us go. They said we should go. So let's go first. So as we go there, you know, God surprises us. So when you are called to go, don't look at how much money that is in your pocket. Don't look at you know, uh, 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 how much clothes you have. Just go ahead. Just take a step of faith. Take a, take a step of faith and go, and God will do the rest. Praise the Lord. Another thing there is that shake off dust under your feet. Shake off any any house or people that do not receive you or hear or, or hear you just do one shut up the doors from your from under your bed. Shut up the doors from under your bed. And that's exactly what he did one day when we went to the 
uh, in a remote village, as we got there, they said that we are spies, that we are come to spy the community and they attack us. Come and see, all of us, we took off. We took off and we flee. That is uh, the kind of running there. We took off and ran for our dear life. Didn't the word of God say when, they, when you are not accepted that you should flee? When they persecute you from, they, may, they just flee from their go to another place. That's exactly what we did that day. We just took off, you know, and ran for our lives. So on the way, one of the boys just stopped and started dusting. He said, what are you doing? He said, he's dusting up now. Huh? Is it not what the word of God said? He started dusting up. I started dusting up. I said, let us run. We are not the people that push you not here. And you just stop to dust up. Please, let's run first. You can dust up when we get to where we're going. You know? But I thank God you know, for everything that that scripture was fulfilled that day. At least I witnessed that one. Praise the Lord. God said, said, I will be with you. I will be with you. The sign that Jesus sent to me is his presence and peace. He said, I will be with you to the end of age. So when you are faced with trouble in your mission work, when you are faced with trouble, when you are faced with persecution, fear, doubt, worry, discouragement, just name it, you know, whenever you are faced with any kind of trouble, just remember that Jesus said, I will be with you to the end of time. So you stand firm. Stand firm. He will always back you up. Praise the Lord. Life is an experience we can live to the fullest with God. Discipleship is a lifestyle. So let's leave it to the Lord. Let your life inspire and influence others who also live their lives in the will of the Lord. Let your life inspire and influence others to also live their lives in the will of the Lord. Andrew found Simon. Philip found Nathaniel. Who are you going to find? Andrew found Simon. Philip found Nathaniel. Who are you going to find? Praise the Lord.
they sold themselves into slavery, took the money, gave to the church, now went to France as slaves, and then started preaching the gospel. When I heard that story, I was asking myself, if we go to heaven, are we going to be in the same? I'm just wondering. Questions? And I want to also pick on something that our sister taught us here. She said, Jesus told them not to take money, not to take bread, no extra clothes. So that they will not take their trust from God and put on those things. You know the funny thing, if you are going on a mission and you have transport to come back, when you see something, you will pay back and go home. But when you have, you, you didn't go with transport and you have gone far, you will only be forced to trust God through that experience. You have no other option. Praise the Lord. Questions. I was hoping people would ask questions. How do you still, how do you be a disciple in this generation? Is it that the discipleship is for those times? Is it still relevant now? I was hoping for questions like that. Please, any questions? The mic is there. Okay, maybe I should be the one to ask. If you don't ask me, I will ask for you. I'm sure that one makes some people sit down well. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Please, let's ask questions. If we really want to apply, I'm sure you will ask questions. How about going out in two? Thank you very much. Even if there are questions from yesterday's teaching and the day before. If there is any question at all, it's a good time. Everybody wants to be loved and accepted. What of self-worth? Sense of being valued. What of significance? A sense of purpose and meaning on earth. Okay, let's look at this first question. The people of this generation Generation now see, sorry, can you read this? See discipling. That's it. Okay, see discipleship or missionary work as an old fashioned, as old fashioned. So, how would you cope with this? This is a very important, very, very important. Um, the rate of persecution now is more, right? But there's another thing that is more now. The rate of pleasure that people really derive now is even more. Those days there was nothing like... Uh, let me look at things that were not existing those days. Let's say those days we hear of bread and fish. If you receive bread and fish morning, noon and night, Will you be happy? Now, there are more things now that makes eating and pleasure more, right? Another thing about this generation is that there's so much technology, there's so much attention away from God. Because people are now independent. Praise the Lord. And because of that independence, it's as though if you travel to as far as America and some of the Western developed world, they see Christianity as old fashioned. If you mention God, they say, ah, it's because you don't want to engage your thinking. It's old fashioned. So that is a very vital question. However, this is the point. No matter how advanced we are, when we take God out of it, we will destroy ourselves. So don't say that discipleship is not relevant again. However, because people are developing, they are, they, the whole time people do discipleship based on, they move from cities to rural areas. You go to places they have no head, and that is the, that is the design. Go to 
places where God is sending you to. So now, people are beginning to look at it in the spheres of influence. You may not need to travel to one village to minister. What if you are a computer engineer or a computer science, scientist? You can bring mission into that sphere, that area of career. There are things they do that do not agree with the truth of God's kingdom. How will you bring that to pass? I want you to understand that in discipleship is the master that is sending you. You are not sending yourself. So you find out exactly what he will have you do. And then you look at the area he's leading you to serve. And then you follow like that. It's still very relevant. It's, in fact, if you ask me, I think it's more relevant now. So it's not old-fashioned. So it's no longer about just going from one place to another in terms of location alone, your area of work, where you live. A lot of people don't have time to sit down and listen to the word of God. But if you live the right life, I remember one quality of discipleship she mentioned. Being an example, if you live the right kind of life, it will be a way to lead people to Christ. Praise the Lord. Let me run through all these other questions. Another one says, how do you know that Jesus... Okay, how do you know that Jesus loved you? Personal. The word here is personal, but I think they mean personally. He's asking a question, how do you know that Jesus loved you personally? True, this is a very important question because there are times in your life when you go through certain things, you feel like, maybe Jesus loves some people, but not me. Have, that, have you felt like that before? And that feeling is there, but let me tell you this. We do not depend on feelings when we come to our relationship with God. Because feelings are not very reliable. Feelings can be coming from ignorance. It's just like somebody that has a ticket in a train. In the ticket, your meal, everything is inside. But because you didn't have extra money in your wallet, you say, ah, this train, I don't want trouble. You stay in your own cabin. Others were going to eat. I can't remember the movie. Then, they will bring food. You guys say, pass. They will pass. They will bring everything in the plane. No? After everything, now look, now say, ask his brother. All these things they are eating since. You want to spend all the money. But I say, no, it's in your ticket already. Then the guy say, ah, in my ticket. Now say, go and bring my food now before something do you. Then the brother say, ah, when they came, you say they should pass. You say, where I pass go? Where I pass go? I don't want trouble. You know, say, I don't go where hunger come. You know, ignorance is the major problem when it comes to the issue of love. And I want to say this very importantly, when it comes to love, there are five major love languages. Some people respond differently to different aspects. For some, an act of service is love. For some, spending quality time is their definition of love. For others, gifts. Gift. When you give them a gift, they believe that you love them. For other people, it is words of affirmation or even discipline. When you correct them, they know you love them. But there are some you correct them, they think you hate them, right? There are some you spend time with them, they will ask you, now time will go talk. Because they are looking at gifts. There are some you give them gifts because they are not lacking that gift. They say, I don't need your gift. I'm looking for an act of service. So the major problem with that is, number one, the devil lies to us to make us feel God doesn't love us. Number two is ignorance. You just don't know. When you know, you will understand how much God loves you. But the most important proof of God's love is that his willingness to exchange his son for us. That is the highest definition of love. Which means God loves you as much as he loved Jesus. That's why he will exchange you for Jesus. You know why? If this pen, sorry, if this pen is 50 naira, it then means if I'm ready to part with 50 naira, that means I value 50 naira as much as I value this pen. So if, Jesus, if God was able to part with Christ for me, it then means he loved me as much as he loved Jesus. I hope that answers your question. 
The devil likes to lie to us about that reality. Another question. Okay. Praise the Lord. Additionally to all that he has said, the person that asks, how can I know, how do I know that God loves me personally? For the fact that you are alive today, for the fact that you are still alive, shows that God loves you. Because there are those that died on the delivery, when they delivered them, they died. There are so many things you have passed through in life and people died and they are still alive. For the fact you are alive, that means that God has a purpose for you. And that means, that means the love of God. Because it is not because of what you have done or what you have earned that you are alive. It's just because of His love that He came to your life. And He came to your life for a purpose. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Mom. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let me just give you something to add to what they said concerning you know, how somebody you know, you know that God loves uh, us or God loves you personally. Uh, one day, that was when, in fact, there are a lot of things God has done in my life to show me that He loves me personally. But this one, let me just share it. We are about to run one head. So, I wasn't a born again Christian. Then, but I go to church every Sunday. Two days to the time, I had a dream. In that dream, I saw question papers. One, two, three. I saw questions, you know, three questions, five questions to answer three. And I said, one, two, three. So I said, what kind of uh, revelation is this? The following day, the day of the exam. That was religious knowledge. I entered the hall. I saw the question. One, two, three. Just like that. One, two, three. Just like that. And I have read, you know, when I, I woke up that day, I read the first one. I read this one. I said, this is a dream now. Huh? Will it come to pass? I didn't know that the Lord was speaking to me. One, two, three. In the sample, I was just uh, looking at the question paper. They did the question paper. I said, ah, it's everything. All right. I said, yes, sir. Because I was still trying to understand what happened. If I had, you know, read the truth, but, you know, very, very well, the three of the three questions very, very well, eh, I would have meant that. Uh, so I knew that right from that, I knew that God has a purpose for me. Why did He not show me biology? Why did He not show me English, mathematics? Why is this only religious thing that He showed me? Uh, why didn't he show me other subjects? It's only religious knowledge that he showed me. So I knew there is something about me. Do you understand? With the word of God. Praise the Lord. Our time is up. What we'll do is, when we have more opportunity, we'll take more questions. But uh, I would like to conclude with one question I just read here. Very, very important thing. The person is asking, how can you preach to people that are already disappointed with God? Right? Um, I'll say two things first before I explain. People in their relationship with us, especially people who come to us as people of God, may sometimes misrepresent God in their dealings with us. For example, if a pastor should say, I will place a curse on you if you don't do what I say. It may give you a wrong experience because that's the person you have seen that came in the name of God. That is one. Number two, a lot of people have a wrong or a faulty relationship with their biological parents. And when they say God is a father, <laughs> some of them say, like my own father. I don't know if you get the ask that question because some fathers can actually disown their children. Maybe the mothers are a bit more careful to say, don't worry, don't we'll still manage. But you know the story, right? So if fathers are image of God and they have misrepresented God before the children, or pastors or so-called 
Christians have misrepresented God before. We need one, we need healing. And that healing doesn't come until we extend forgiveness. That is one. Number two, see, there are many times, not just in this generation, that God has been misrepresented by different people. However, when people have a personal encounter with God, the scales fall off their eyes and they will realize that, oh, is this what really was? When it comes to reaching out, it is more important that you build friendship. Don't just come and say, I bring you the word of God, I bring you truth, you must receive it or perish. Don't impose it. The only people you have authority to impose it on are probably people that you make choices for. Praise the Lord. For example, my daughter now, if she wakes up, I will say, let us pray. You know why I will do that? Because at this stage, I'm making decisions for her. That one is something different. But if it's somebody that is your friend, you don't impose yourself on that person. It is something of relationship. It has to do with friendship. So, I heard a story of a man. A woman said they were going to preach. Then she got to a restaurant and was abusing the people that served her food. After abusing them and turned to go, then they went. Part of the people she abused were the people she went to minister to. Then when she got there, it was difficult to minister. She looked, they can say, you, you be Christian. So, that was when repentance came. Circumstances like that, the important thing for us is let's not allow our hurts and what people have done to us or how people have misrepresented God to come between us and God. And that is why everybody has access to God. Everybody. What most of the disciples do is to engage you to have that relationship. After that, their job is done. And then you can grow from them. Praise the Lord. But more importantly, if you don't get that healing, it will be difficult to see God the same way. Thank you very much. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Uh, please listen attentively to the following information about tomorrow because tomorrow will be fully loaded. Tomorrow we are starting by 10 a.m. What time did I say? 10 a.m. And you will come fasting. Please, you will come fasting. Don't fast a little bit tomorrow. We will provide you with a light refreshment at the appropriate time. Become fasting. Tomorrow we will have counseling, deliverance teaching, deliverance called out, post-deliverance, how you can maintain your deliverance. And if time permits us, but Alex will also enlighten us on how we can hear the voice of God. So tomorrow we'll be fully loaded. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I was very, very interested in that last question. How do you preach to somebody who is disappointed? I was very, very interested in that question. And um, you might see so many people in the course of going out to preach, telling you, okay, the God we are talking about, I don't think he knows, he can even remember my name. I don't think I am also in his books. Abi? Oh yes, you may see so many like that because of the challenges of life. So they completely feel that 
God does not know that they exist. How do you do that? I think Alex has said it very well. Build what? Relationship. Try and be good. Try and show some level of love because even Satan responds to love. Try and show what? Some level of love concern until that person comes out of that shell and then you can share the word of God with the person. Not when the person act, ah, my brother, that's so all, but, uh, but uh, once you start like that, you are gone. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I will lift up Jesus. Ah, yeah. Can we rise up? We have been sitting for how many hours? Amen. I will lift up, lift up Jesus. Oh, Jehovah, Alpha, Omega.